Welcome back to the Great Evangelical Disaster Podcast. My name is Herb Shattuck, and today we're going to continue our study on the New Covenant. The last uh, couple of podcasts that we did, we talked about the administration and the mechanism of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and we gave you, a, I think, a pretty fair mechanical overview of how they work and who they apply to and what it takes to implement them in our lives. Today I want to take a little bit of a different take, and we're going to be looking at the writings of the Apostle John. And over the years, John has become more and more my inspiration and the, the apostle that I guess I hold in the highest esteem. And not just because he was the apostle that Jesus loved, but because of his, the depth and the richness of his writings, layer upon layer, that only the person who has gone over it hundreds of times and, and petitioning the Holy Spirit can really see the message that John is writing. And as we look at John's gospel specifically, we see that pretty much his entire gospel is focused on his favorite subject, I would submit to you, the New Covenant. And his passion was to get people not only to understand it, but to live it and to embrace it and to follow it and use it as the means by which to be imitators of Christ and to be pleasing to God himself. And so we open up one of the, the first miracle that John records was, of course, the miracle at Cana. And here we find Jesus and his mother Mary at a wedding feast, and halfway through the feast, the wine is running out, which is causing great panic on the part of the host or the wine steward. And f somehow Mary catches wind that, of this, and he tells the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. And so we pick it up in verse 6 of chapter 2, and it says, Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water. So they filled them to the brim, and he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to, the, to him, and when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man who serves the good wine first, and the, when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. And so we see that this remarkable miracle is taking place. And we've all been told that the servants filled the six water pots and then they pulled the, wa the water or the wine out of the six water pots and they served it. And when I first became a believer, I guess about eight or ten weeks after I first believed, I enrolled in this small Bible college, which is unfortunately now defunct, but one of the first classes that I took was uh, Life of Christ. And the textbook that went along with this cl class was this massive volume of like a thousand pages. And it was written by a Jew whose name was Alfred Edersheim in 1890. And he had come to Christ later on in his life. So he brought with him this rich tradition, Jewish tradition, historical background, cultural background. The name of the book, and I highly recommend it, is The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And as Edersheim describes the wedding feast at Cana, he gives a very different picture, and I think one that will be truly amazing. He says the six stone water pots represented the Old Covenant, and it had a limited time to go, and Jesus, understanding that, said, fill these things up right now and keep these for the limited time of purification that it would still be needed. But the water that was drawn out, that was turned then into the much better wine, came from the well. So when he says, 
draw some out now, where do you draw water from? Well, you typically draw water from the well. And so they drew the water from the well, filled the water pots up. Then he said, now draw the, wa draw the water or draw some out now. And that became the new wine, if you will, the better wine. And so the old wine represents the old covenant, which was running out and was inferior. And the new wine coming from the well would be an everlasting source without end, without any fear of running out. And this was the better wine, which represented the new covenant. And the head waiter remarks saying, wow, who does this brings out the new wine or the better wine after the old wine or the inferior wine has run out. And it's a clear picture of the two covenants, which we know from our studies before are often represented by wine. And as we continue to look at John, we look at uh, John chapter 4, and we see that there's a, again, a picture of a, a well. And Jesus is speaking to this woman at the well in Samaria, and she asks him that, you know, what are you doing? Give me a drink. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. So again, he's he's making a a a reference to something that is physical, but he is referring to something that is spiritual. And so she, we know that she says give him give him this water and then she says you're not greater than our father Jacob and Jesus answered her doesn't answer her direct question says everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again from this well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So again, it's a picture of the water of the Holy Spirit coming from within you and never ending springing up to eternal life. And then we know in John chapter 6, after the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus gives a sermon and says, Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you shall have no life in you. And he, again, this was a clear reference to communion, which was later to be instituted in a, in a formal way. And this whole picture of communion is really the picture of the new covenant. It's Christ within you. And we take the the bread and we take the cup, what do we do? We ingest them into our body. And as we digest the bread and the wine, their molecules become indistinguishable distinguishable from the molecules within our body. And so in that sense, we become one with Christ and he becomes one with us. And there is no distinction between the, the bread and the wine which we've ingested and us, and that that harkens us to what he was telling us in John 14, which is just probably one of the most mind-blowing chapters in the whole Bible, where it says, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Do you see the picture of communion there? And so John is really just emphasizing the new covenant and this relationship to those who have ears to hear and who can see through the surface level of the account and through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, dig a little deeper and see a little bit more, or a lot more in this case, of what John is communicating. And with that kind of setup, I'd like to point us now, and this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time, in John 13... And another very familiar passage, which is the wiping or the washing of the disciples' feet. And we pick it up in verse 3, and here's what it says. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, well, that's quite the setup, right? It's, it's the culmination of everything. It's, it's, it's a pronouncement of what is going to follow 
is of utmost significance, right? And so he got up from supper, and he laid aside his garments, and taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel with which he was girded. And so he came to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, do you, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. And Peter said to him, Never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And, and Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him, and for this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. So then... When he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you are right, and for so I am. If then the Lord and the teacher washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. And so we've heard the Sunday school classes and probably many sermons describing this series of events. And the point of this whole uh, description is that we are to be have a servant attitude and we are to serve and that the Lord came to serve and we are not greater than our master. And therefore, whatever the task is, no matter how lowly, no matter how humble, we are to take it up and just serve one another. And that is very true. But I would, again, submit to you that there is something much deeper here and even more important than the lesson or the example on servanthood. Let's take a look at this passage and kind of examine it a little more, more closely to see and pick up the real underlying meaning of what John is communicating here. So Jesus said to Simon Peter when he says, do you wash my feet? Because this was, Peter was watching it. It says, so he came to Peter, so or to Simon Peter. So Peter wasn't the first one. Obviously, he was either the third or the fifth, or maybe he was the 11th by that time. And Peter is watching this whole thing unfold, and his jaw was dropping because, as we know, when somebody enters into, the, into a house for a meal... It's normally the lowest servant on the rung that has the job of washing the feet of all the guests. And Peter is seeing the Messiah, the, 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 who he says, you are, thou art the Christ, the chosen one, sitting down and doing what would be so far beneath his rank and stature that it was simply outrageous and appalling to Peter. And so Peter, you can imagine in his mind, is thinking with his arms crossed and his, his head down and his brow furrowed that when Jesus gets to me, there's no way that I'm going to let him wash my feet. No, no, no. That is not going to happen. And so Peter protests. And Jesus answered him and tries to, to address him and says, What I do now you do not realize, but you will understand hereafter. So the first thing is saying, like, Peter, just trust me on this one, all right? But also it gives us some insight here. Now, if Peter was the sixth or the eighth or whatever it was, and as soon as the foot washing picture was completed, Jesus explains the, the servanthood point. So that might have taken a half an hour or 10 minutes or whatever it was. So you would never explain that by saying you will understand hereafter. No, you're going to understand in eight minutes. That's not hereafter. So that's our first clue that maybe there's something deeper and even more to this story than first meets the eye. And then Peter said to him, never shall you wash my feet. And Jesus replies with something that is 
that just catches t- catches his breath, that takes his breath away, that that puts him back on his heels. He says, "If I do not wash you, you have no part with me." Wait a minute, Jesus! After three years of walking with you, of defending you, of calling me to walk on the water, I left my home, my business, my family. I've listened to your every word. I've uh, you know that I am as committed as anybody could possibly be to you and to what you're what you're what you're saying and preaching. You're telling me that if I don't let you do what a lowly servant would typically be tasked with doing, that our entire relationship is over based on this? And Simon Peter says, Okay, fine, have it your way. Lord, then wash not only my feet and my hands, and in this just complete confusion and emotional responses of Peter, we see unfolding exactly the interaction that the Lord God Almighty wants to interact so that we, 2,000 years later, can understand this very deep and very important, significant, true picture. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And he says, you are clean, but not all of you. So what is the picture here? The picture is our great high priest ministering in the tabernacle to those who he calls his own. And the picture here is of the believer who has been already washed clean, but through the journey of life is going to pick up some of the dust on the road, and that would be representative of inadvertent sin, of stumbles along the way. And it doesn't disqualify us completely. It doesn't make us unclean. However, there is still the imperative, the necessity of going to Jesus to have this dirt that we pick up along this road of life periodically washed clean. And short of that foot washing or sprinkling of to cleanse our conscience from sin and make it once again perfect, Jesus will not continue his relationship with us. Does that blow your mind as it did mine when I first began to see what Jesus is talking about? And again, let's refer to 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have two things, fellowship with one another and the blood of Christ Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And so here it is. We're walking in the light because we have been made clean. We have been given a new spirit. We have been given his Holy Spirit. And we have the, we've been created in righteousness. We've been born again. We're a new creation. We have a new nature now. But yet at the same time, as John says, I write these things to you, little children, so that you may not sin. But if any one of you sins, what happens? We have a foot washer in the heavenly realm. We have a great high priest who will sprinkle us and be made clean again. And so this incredible picture of the new covenant interwoven and interlayered in a story that at first glance is about servanthood makes this just mind-blowingly just magnificent. And it does several things. One is we see the genius of God in the new covenant as he lives within us, walks within us. And in John chapter 3, he says, he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his Deeds might be manifested as having been wrought in God. Christ in you, the hope of glory, produces deeds that are not filthy rags. They are righteous deeds. How are they righteous deeds? Because they've been wrought by God. 
How they've been wrought by God? Out in the heavenlies? No. Within us, they bring forth rivers or springs of living water, which are these deeds that have been wrought by God that we produce so that men may see them. Isn't that just incredible and amazing? And so how does this look at as we implement this in our lives? And I think that, you know, as John finishes his gospel, he finishes it with the picture of the man who will eventually embrace the new covenant and will fulfill the calling that he has been entrusted with. He, when, when Simon Peter was on the, on the shore and Jesus came and he says that, you know, he goes, again, cast out your net and they come in with the fish and Peter recognizes Jesus and he jumps from the boat and he swims to it because he's so excited about seeing Jesus again. And then Jesus sits down in that famous discussion and says, Peter, do you love me? And again, if Peter, Peter wasn't taken back before, that just caught him like a left hook. Lord, what are you saying? Of course, I love you. I, I don't know how else I can say it. What can I do? Yeah, I know. I, I denied you three times. I, I can't believe I did it, but I did. And it is, it is the most devastating thing that it, it's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. And he asked him three times because to coincide with the fact that he denied him three times, probably. But when they finish this, it said... He says to Simon Peter, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. Peter, you were in control of your destiny. You were your own man. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now he was signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And so who is it now that will gird Peter and bring him where he does not wish to go? Is it the, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders? Is it, is it the Romans? No. It's Jesus. Jesus will now take control of Peter's life through this new covenant, I am in you and you are in me, communion. And he will now determine Peter's path. And Peter's path will not be something that Peter would choose. As a matter of fact, any sane person would choose just the opposite outside of understanding who it is that is guiding him and what the end result, eternally speaking, is. And Peter and Jesus turns to Peter and he said to him, follow me. And you cannot follow Jesus outside of new covenant life and abiding in him and he in you and diligently seeking after him so that you would know his will and that you would have the courage and the conviction and the ability to do his will as he leads you to the very place, the most unlikely place where you think you would ever end up. This is the new covenant. This is what John wants the true disciples to understand and realize and implement and follow in their lives so that they will one day enter the kingdom with glory and honor. To he who has ears to hear this incredible gospel.